All right, we are live. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yep, we're good. Great. Um, so we're here with James at Superseed. He's in the UK. Uh, him and I have had some really good discussions in the past and uh, excited to have him as a guest on our show. Also here with Bonnie Harper, uh, Bonnie Halper and uh, a few other people in the, uh, in the tech community. Uh, we are global now, so we've got people from all over the world dialing in, um, people who are uh, in the tech scene, people who are aspiring VCs, um, emerging managers. Um, so on that note, uh, James, welcome to the show. Thanks for popping in. Pleasure. And, um, Pleasure. Yeah. And uh, would love to maybe hear a little bit about your background, your career, uh, you know, where you grew up and um, how you navigated to where you are now. Maybe we can kick off with that and then see where the conversation takes us. Yeah, perfect. So um, maybe I'll just talk a little bit how I sort of moved into VC and then mm -hmm. that will link back to one of the sort of um, contributing factors is my is my location, which is Cambridge in, in the UK. So um, I came into VC in a non-linear non fashion. Um, I am a mechanical and electronics engineer by education. Um, it was something that I was good at um, and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was... You know, it was one of the things that interested me. Um, I was pretty torn between going into law and sort of investment and um, more of the technical side. Chose the technical side and really enjoyed at least the first four, sort of five or six years of it. I was doing um, product design, machine design, intellectual property, um, workarounds, all sorts of different things like that for global brands. Um, so we had a technology consultancy business that I worked at out of Cambridge. Um, Cambridge is a big hotbed, you know, Silicon Fen, then it came, it's a, a tech sort of ecosystem now where mm -hmm. they've been at the forefront of all sorts of different um, technologies, Bluetooth, CSR, you have all sorts of different things like ARM. So ARM is the sort of backbone of almost every, um, every chip within yeah. uh, mobile phones, you know, it's, it's insane. Um, so I sort of started in that environment. So from a technical perspective, it was a great proving ground. Mm -hmm. It's a great place to start. Um, and with consulting, you get chucked in at the deep end. So you get given a pack um, and the flight details, and then you jump on a plane and you read the pack, and then you're meant to sort of land at 20, how old is I, 24, mm -hmm. walk, into a, walk into a room full of people that have been doing this, you know, working at this company for 10, 15 years and meant to be sort of competent. So um, it very, you, you learn very quickly to, to sort of get what we call a T-shaped consulting. So you're very broad, you have a, a sort of reasonable competency in a lot of different things, and then you build out a specialism. So it's a really great proving ground for testing yourself mentally um, and adapting all the different things that you've learned in different areas and applying them for different um, projects. Um, I enjoyed it a lot, but um, eventually became a bit sort of frustrated with not really being able to control my own destiny destiny so um i decided to leave um and although i'd worked on some really interesting projects i'd work on smoking cessation project for bat um where british american tobacco where they were sort of trying to provide experiences without losing customers i think is the flight way of saying it, it you know yeah. fantasy smoking has a has a sort of inverse correlation to, to sure. customer growth um so they we worked on some interesting things there i designed some of the first versions of e-cigarettes mm -hmm. um so worked on some really cool stuff but it was a bit frustrating not being able to sort of control what i was up to so um that was my first step into entrepreneurship so 20 april 2010 um, I founded my first business that I was working at. Previously, I'd sort of done some investments and some sweat equity into sort of local startup businesses that were just interesting. Sure. But this was my first big venture. Mm -hmm. So I quit and, um, yeah, sort of just went out on my semi-own. I'd recommend yeah. having a co-founder. And what's the, um, let's hear the origin story of that. So what, what was the trigger that said, Hey, you know what, I'm going to start this. Cause I, so, I, uh... <laughs> so I, so I grew up in um, a small village just outside of Cambridge. Sure. Um, and my father was um, technical director of a business called um, Lynx computers. Mm -hmm. So at the time you had Amstrad um, BBC, Acorn um, and you, you you sort of had these things going on in Cambridge and links. Um, he was not a sort of overt entrepreneur, but a lot of Cambridge folk aren't the sort of maybe the quintessential entrepreneur, the sort of bold, brash, 
you know, mm-hmm. very, very sort of keen and going to change the world type of entrepreneur. But he he worked in a lot of small businesses. And so I grew up around that. That was normal for me. Mm-hmm. And he, um, oh, I don't know, he, he, it did quite well. They, they listed um, very early 80s and on paper was worth lots of money. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the, 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 the company listed and then uh, sort of collapsed. So um, he, he was then worth not, not very much money. <laughs> um, so when I grew up, I was, you know, used to having a, a company that was being run out in the offices in the in the back out of the back of my house it's, that's like normal for me mm-hmm. whereas all of my friends it was normal for them to you know dad gets in a job and just plods his way through and well not plods so it's offensive but you know just sort of stays in that business and builds builds their way up through that that was their career so like the corporate kind of, ladder pretty much right corporate ladder yeah and it's yeah. just the sort of normal well <laughs> the normal thing but for me the normal thing was you know go and build something go and do something if you want to do something you know learn it learn your trade and then go and play it yourself. So um, I made friends with a guy called Tom Wood um, who has since go on, gone on to found quite an interesting business called Kazana. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's, he's an entrepreneur by, um, by, by default as well, sort of. Um, and we, we got on really well and both of us just said, look, we, we don't like some of the elements of what we're doing. There's some of it's super interesting. And do we want to be billed at, you know, 1200, to 1500 bucks a day and see 100 or 150 bucks it's like you know come on there's there's a big margin in there that that, that, that's not fair so we thought right let's just design our own consultancy um and we we did that and left and um yeah that's how the first sort of first venture started um tough times pretty pretty brutal 2000 you know back back into 07 Mm -hmm. things were starting to happen real impact you know uh, 08 um and our model was to use research and research and development um tax breaks as a as a trojan horse mm-hmm. so we're still doing technical consultancy we go into a business we'd understand what they're up to as a business um with the with the sort of premise that we're going to increase their r d tax claim so by understanding exactly what they needed to do mm-hmm. as a business and 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 um all the sort of steps of things they're going to need to they will have already done or will need to do in the future meant that their tax claims got got larger so um we had a specialist in the tax area that we worked with Mm -hmm. and it was kind of an easier way to get the doors opened up into a business hey would you like free money and it Um, sounds like a win-win because you get paid for your services but then you're also decreasing their overhead from the tax savings as well so it's like everybody it it was that was the approach right so um I always try, so I've got quite an interest in incentive structures um, and I'm a sort of um, wannabe behavioral economist (laughs) in the sense of that I'm I'm not educated in it uh, to the level that I would like to be, but um, I'm going to study psychology and and I'm very interested in the way that people behave. And um, one of the things that we have always tried to do in the things that I build is to try and make it as close to win-win as possible because mm-hmm. the closer that you are to trying to deliver to trying to deliver something that they genuinely want the less sales you need the less yeah. marketing you need and um you know one of my um i had a business mentor for about three or four years and um he was a formidable chap um uh, very um very good at cutting through to what's needed very quickly, mm-hmm. very good at asking the pertinent questions. But, you know, one of the things he said was um, be interesting and interested and your marketing will work for itself. So, you know, we, we, we were trying to do something that was interesting and we were genuinely interested in the businesses mm-hmm. that we worked with and we try to um, deliver some real value. And if you're delivering real value on the, on, as the outset, then you're likely to get paid because people yeah. don't always lead out with a cost. So, um, yeah, so we did, we did that. We, 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 we used a sort of Trojan horse approach. Um, it meant that they got something for effectively nothing. So we took a, an ups- we took a skim on the increase in R and D tax sure. claim. But by this point, the concept was that they'd, you know, we'd released extra capital for them and they've, um, they, they, they've basically shown us what they're up to from a technical capacity. So 
there's hopefully some more money in the business. Um, sure. We know what their problems are. And the idea is we'd then sell technology consulting on the back of it. Yeah. So it's a little bit of an upsell on top of the uh, Yeah. So it's kind of sort of them allowing. So the normal consulting process is you have multiple <clears throat> meetings trying to build mm-hmm. trust. And eventually they start to tell you what their problems are. Like it's, sure. it's like psychologist 101, right? You don't sort of meet someone. They just tell you all their deepest, darkest secrets and problems. So yeah. um, we, we, we sort of tried to go in that way and if we've increased the amount of capital within the business available to do stuff then hopefully they would be more inclined to pay spend that money with us Mm -hmm. helping you know we know the business a bit more now they've got capital and we can hopefully um help them use it to to grow the business now the problem was by 2010 people had used up most of their reserves um trying to sort of either either tread water and not and not not implode or grow within the within the sort of pressures that are going on so what we didn't account for and this is you know all of this stuff is just learning um and in this incentive structures element um the cfos the fds etc were spending allocating the capital before it even returned so you know so someone in within the within the finance department says hey you know we r and tax claim is now uh, 200k or something and they're like oh great you know it's 150 grand more than it was that's great fine i'm gonna have 150k more boom they've allocated it and then you know two three four months later we come back and go hey you know the project you're working on needs some support they're like yeah it does it does but we haven't got any cash sure oh well you know <laughs> you should have some more money. It's like, no, we need that to keep the lights on. So mm-hmm. it was, it was tough building the business. We, we grew from two of us to 12 of us um, within about two years. Mm-hmm. Um, and another lesson learned is that um, the number of bodies does not necessarily, if, if you haven't got good unit economics within, within the, within the structure, just having more people going in the business just increases your stress and, and you, you sit yeah. there on your margin and then you, your margin just stays the same, give or take a tiny bit, mm-hmm. but your, your, your stress level, your, the, the yeah. problems that are beneath you increase. So we had 12 of us. Um, we didn't really see much more money at the top um, sure. because we were trying to grow the business. So we kind of had increasing pressures with, without really much more financial stability. Um, long story short in that sense the one of our clients was representing quite a large bit of our 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 revenue Mm -hmm. and had a frank discussion with him uh what does next year look like he's like yeah it looks good we're going to be hopefully nearly doubling what we need to do how are you guys going and i'm like not great like you know things are tough we we we, we're going to have to sort of start letting people go if we can't yeah grow um and he actually decided to buy the business okay so yeah, we made made the first exit um, mm-hmm. pretty early on. Yeah, um, it was that was difficult as well because obviously... I thought you were going to tell me a different outcome. Like the way that you were leading up the story, I thought you were going to tell me that you folded the business, but you're like, oh, no. we ex- we exited. So well, we, we we kind of so we exited, but but yeah. it, it was not great, right? I, I still had to work. Sure, and, and I'm, yeah. We made a bit of money, but but nothing. Yeah. Definitely not worth all the risk and absolutely and, and heartache. Yeah, um, I got a couple of quick questions. Employed. So I got a question. So um, <clears throat> this is something that I've I've experienced in the past when uh, launching my own business. You know, it's been it's always been a magical experience for me when I got my first customer. Right, so it's that first paying customer. Um, so how did you feel the first time that you you know you did your consulting mm-hmm. business and you got that first payment you know you check the bank a few times refresh the browser and made sure that the payment was really there but how did that make you feel you know what was going on in your head um so i generally i suppose i don't like to count my chickens yeah um or count your eggs before the hatch um, mm-hmm. however you want to to do it but um so even when you signed a contract, my mm-hmm. mindset then moves to making sure I can deliver. Sure. And so this is not not a very uplifting yeah. <laughs> way, but yeah. I kind of just, my mindset shifts and then yeah. I'm like, okay, now I've got to deliver. So now I need mm-hmm. to make sure that all the team that's going to be on it is working. They've got the right stuff to do. They know what they've got to do. I, I, what do I need to do in terms of focus on other things? So mm-hmm. now I need to sell more. I need to do, yeah. do other work. And um, it's very much a collegiate thing because we were 
um, relatively flat as a business. We tried to keep sure. it quite flat. So a lot of sales were pretty, pretty mutual. Um, I afforded myself a, just a, just a little yeah. micro, micro guess, pat on my back. I guess and the I'm patch like, back should on. also be, and I, I feel like the patch should really be given at least when you deliver the product and you know that the customer's yeah. happy. Maybe then it's safe to patch your back because because they may get pissed off and you might have to give them a refund if you don't make them Yeah, super I mean, happy. consulting's consulting's tough because yeah. um, you're you're expensive, right? Yeah. You know, you you cost money and and people internally go, I'm on, you know, the equivalent of X a day and you're sure. being billed at 5x or 6x or 7x the the money um so you're expected to over deliver all the time so it's never a relaxed thing it's not like if you've got you know so w- what we we do at the moment is a, is within the fund is invest in b2b SaaS. so um you know if your software's all built and and it's done correctly and you sign clients it's it's money and yeah, and absolutely. you know you, you 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 can't relax but you you can just sort of you know hopefully the client mm-hmm. is is happy and carries on with consulting it's a constant interaction so yeah that was another lesson learned in in what type of business do you want to get involved in mm-hmm. um it's tough like it was it's not it's not easy um yeah. and they are in general pretty um difficult people like it's it's not it's a difficult situation so sure. there's a um uh a, a, a book by um Richard Thaler, and um, he he talks about speaking to a chap who runs a very successful um, restaurant, who sells his um, his seats in 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 a sort of bulk thing at the start of the season, mm-hmm. and you reserve it, and I think it's like I don't know, hundred bucks a seat or something for for the, for the restaurant. So and sure. he sells out like boom straight away, and the economist was saying you know the economist approach is well do it as an auction get the highest value that you can for each of the tickets and 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 let you know let the market decide what they're willing to pay and the restaurant chap was like well no because if i let someone pay a thousand dollars two thousand dollars for a dinner it doesn't matter how good i am they're they're going to be a bit like meh you know, at the end of it, they're like, oh, is it good? Sure. Yeah, it was good. But is it worth $2,000? Nah, probably not. You know, yeah. would you do it again? Well, I don't know. And we, we kind of suffer from that same situation. If you're mm-hmm. being billed at quite a large amount of money, um, you constantly have to massively over deliver just to yeah. just to tread water. Sure. So it's not it's not a relaxed thing. You kind of don't really ever get any downtime. Mm-hmm. Um, and during this period, I uh, b- bought a house and... Um, started a family got married and all these other things yeah. like life choices where you've got lots of other like things you would probably prefer to be doing than sure. working till like one in the morning and then <laughs> so it's not it's definitely um consulting is definitely not a space that i when i left i didn't i didn't miss it yeah i got I a good like question that. here so somebody in the audience uh sarah uh, her question is, do you have any advice on how to treat clients where it might not have ended particularly well, but you want to leave the door open for future collaboration? So I guess if, uh, you know, the client just wasn't happy, is there any way to hopefully, you know, re-engage or yeah. you know, possibly save um, that account? So, yeah, we, we we had a few that were pissed off when when we were working Mm-hmm. in in my company and you had unhappy clients or un- unhappy situations when i was working at my previous consultancy obviously rule one is like try not to let them get to that position <laughs> like monitor yeah. them and, and try and build that relationship where you can mm-hmm. be honest if something's screwed up like if you have a relationship with a client you can go um and you have to balance it because some people can't take can't take the down news and can't wait until it's solved yeah. Some people can take, look, okay, last week, this thing happened. What I did is this, and and now we're here. And they're like, oh, yeah, you should have told me. It's like, yeah, okay, but, you know, look, I had to act on it fast, and now we're here, and now I think we've got this way out. So you can sort of manage people that way. If you are doing your damnedest, like you're trying to do your best job and just something screws up, I kind of just, I think, I think – the best is just to be honest and open with them and say, look, you know, I dropped a ball. Look, 
this happened, that happened, this situation happened beyond it, or, or, or look, I was doing this, this is the way I was trying to monitor this situation. I had weekly reviews with these clients, these people, and I did this, and here's my reports and everything. Look, I really tried to keep on top of this situation, and here's our weekly reviews that I did with all of your managers who, you know, mm-hmm. maybe didn't report up to you properly or hadn't highlighted. Look, here's the, here's my email saying to the managers, look, this thing's wrong, and and look, you need to escalate this or whatever, and say, look, I've really tried my best. This is what mm-hmm. I tried to build, um, but also say look i it's my it's my bad as well because i should have probably gone above your the managers and come straight to you and and had that discussion or whatever the other thing is to maybe talk through the problem Mm -hmm. so when when something's happened is to and if it's really bad situation i I would suggest paying um uh, um what they called um not an uh, not an arbitrator um, yeah, arbitrate like mm-hmm. basically people to sit in the, in 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 the middle of the conversation. Um, but if you can do it direct, it's just have that conversation with them. Just try and understand what the problem is. A lot of the time, again, back to the incentives thing. Sometimes the thing they're pissed off at you about is not actually the real problem. Mm-hmm. It's it's a mechanism. It's a thing that they can hook on that something else is happening. And sometimes it's not even anything you've really done. Sure. Um, so having a conversation about it is a good way to open it up. And mm-hmm. you might find, look, he, this person just got, you know, completely bollocked by their boss um, for something. And actually they're annoyed at you because they should have done something themselves. And it's yeah. easier for them to just blame the consultant or whatever. Um, if you've genuinely done something wrong, just, I, in my opinion, try and sort it. And but open up that dialogue as quickly as possible but you will just get people that just you 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 can't please um sure i've met people that are permanently unhappy they're just always unhappy with everything yeah. it doesn't matter what you do like you you, you show them 99 successes they'll, they'll the first thing they look at on the list what where, where are we at with that and it's like come on look uh, you know, in your head you're like come on i've done all these yeah. things it's like we're, we're way further than we should be and they're like what's that thing and i think there are some people just unfortunately built a bit like that yeah no look i've experienced the same thing and uh some people just uh, the final the final thing on that is do you do you want to work with them yeah um going forward if they're people sometimes believe that it's a one-way thing that you Mm -hmm. always need the client and you should always be looking to secure the client but it is kind of a relationship and i i prefer to work with people i enjoy Mm -hmm. um and and maybe that's a luxury um that i've maybe lost out on some things by you know maybe i've lost out on some money or maybe i've lost out on you know some other project or whatever because mm-hmm. i kind of just didn't get on with the people and i thought you know what i would prefer not to have six months of being shouted at even if i'm going to get paid a bit more extra money um yeah. with them being permanently annoyed so it doesn't it doesn't always have to be one way if you if you don't like the client um and you don't need to have them um Maybe you don't take them. Yeah, that's an interesting trade-off. So another trade-off I have that could be interesting is, um, you know, the hiring process, right? So you could either do everything yourself and not sleep, or you could pay something to someone else to take off those hours. So, you know, how many times have you dealt with that? I'm sure that was a common thing in the beginning, especially when you're starting, because you, you scaled up to 12 people. So walk me through kind of like your thought process when you were trying to take things off your plate and um you know manage paying versus saving the money and doing it yourself and only i'm only asking because i've dealt with that yeah uh, recently yeah um i mean you start you start that in most jobs as you start to move up the ranks a bit you you kind of you you, you're not the end of the you know you're not the tail of the whip Mm -hmm. there's not all this stuff happening somewhere else and you're just at the end just trying to like sort all the firefighting all the stuff that's just all the crap that's just getting chucked at you yeah um when you are founding a business you 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 are all things and everything um but you know common advice is just tr- try and know what you're good at and what your you know where your mm-hmm. gaps are and, and hopefully fill fill the gaps with people that are lightning at it just love it you know yeah. that's what they get out of bed for because then they're not forced to do it mm-hmm. if you don't like admin um you're not a details person you're not good at organizing just get someone who's passionate about it because 
that makes it so much easier because they're not forcing themselves to do it. You're not forcing yeah. yourself to do it. You have to be organized. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But um, you can, you can begin to surround yourself with people that are better at elements of what you do. I think the constant battle, and it's exactly the same with entrepreneurs building their businesses as well as um, people going up through the ranks within a business. There's an, um, an old adage around you, you, you rise to your level of incompetence. Um, I think if you are the CEO of something, co-founder, whatever your you know title is, or manager, or whatever, um, you're expected. You you perceive that you're expected to be brilliant at everything, mm-hmm. and that you should be able to do everything. And there are some people that can. Um, you know, uh, um, the managing partner of the fund that I'm at is 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 one of those people. Um, but they're super, 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 super rare. Um, most people have a competency and an ability in some areas or a big in- interest in some areas, which drives them to be competent. And then they have gaps. And so being honest enough with yourself about what you can change and develop and what you are inherently unlikely to get to the level that you need to, mm-hmm. um, if, if, if it gets to that point, if you discover the things that, look, I can learn this stuff, but it's going to take up what, you know massive amount of my time to get really good at something when actually I can bring someone in or I can you know find the right team members within the group to, to take those elements, that sure. will accelerate you faster, I think. Um, and then the, the other thing, I suppose I've witnessed it in the technical side as well. I mean, I was around technically better better engineers than me like they were technically much better um but my skill was was unpicking what the client actually really wanted and and what the real problem was that they were trying to solve sure so i i was never going to be a better technical engineer than them but as a package i could be potentially better value within the business so um and i suppose the final thing is that sometimes as a business grows you feel exposed Mm -hmm. and if you've built a team around you who are great you can sometimes begin to feel well what's my value like what what am i a fraud like now i've built this amazing team around me and you know they're better at everything that i can do and what am i and you kind of get this like existential like sort of what what am I worth um, sort of thing um sure but you know maybe step away from that business at that point maybe yeah. maybe leave it to run itself and bring a new CEO in and become mm-hmm. a chairman and or or Ned or whatever and just you know that's an amazing achievement you've built something so mm-hmm. well that it can run its not run itself but you know it runs without you um so yeah it's it is difficult to do but I think mm-hmm. you have to be open and honest with your own failings and, yeah. and gaps and, and think what's worth my time. I think, I think valuing your own time is important as well. Yeah, it's good advice. I think a couple things from that is uh, obviously if you can pick people that can do things better than you can and they're passionate about it, that also probably helps with retention. I'm, I'm assuming too, because yeah. they just love it. I mean, if you, yeah. if you just suck at social media, um, but you find somebody that just loves getting on TikTok and posting stuff about yep. your business, then, Hey, that's great. Um, and then another quote that comes to my mind, I think it's from Napoleon Hill. Um, he said that good leaders can replicate themselves. So if you're, you know, obviously if you're the CEO and you can copy a couple versions of yourself, you know, mm-hmm. that definitely helps as well. So that's uh, just something that came to my mind when I listened to that um, audio book a couple months ago. So mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk about the next stage. So, uh, you know, had a, had a favorable exit and then, um, did you take some time off? Um, or? no. So we, this is how I then started getting to investment because mm-hmm. what they were buying, they, they were buying up intellectual property from distressed businesses. Okay. Um, so they found a way to highlight when IP was going to become expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, they would then, uh, because it's all public record. And they're on certain timelines. You, you're on a conveyor belt when you go into IP. Um, so you can locate all IP that, that meets a certain criteria, yeah. which is of a certain time frame. 
and then you review the IP for strength and then you review the IP for um, commerciality. So the ability to commercialize the, the technology. And so we were performing the technical due, due diligence for, for this group. And then they were, they'd partnered with a wealth management business to raise capital. And the, we were buying up the IP, working out how we could, you know, so we'd review the IP, work out the best stuff to buy, and then we'd raise investment um, mm -hmm. around it. And so that's how I started in. So I was doing the technical work. So I was investment analyst when we, when I joined the group, um, then became investment manager. So I was then working on the portfolio of companies. I was working on the IM and doing the sort of end to end, became director of a few of the businesses and started to sort of work into in more depth in the investment side. And I enjoyed it. I, I, I liked, um, I like the interaction with the investors where, when things are going well, <laughs> so yeah. sometimes it's not, not always going well. Um, but that, but I, it definitely started to push me into, into that space. So I'd um, had a taste of corporate, had a, a great exposure to sort of world leading brands, um, Unilever, p and um, Coca-Cola, BAT, et cetera, Johnson mm -hmm. Johnson. Um, I'd then done some entrepreneurship, um, you know, built, 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 building a business myself, starting to scale teams and, and um, crying and drinking champagne and um, shouting and, uh, you know, all sorts of the ups and downs. Um, and then I started to move into the investment side and I, and, mm -hmm. and I really just sort of, I just clicked with it. I, I, I just found it really interesting. It's a lovely combination from, from my perspective, from my brain. Um, it's a lovely combination of technical. It's a lovely combination of people um psychology marketing um analysis um and then peer play finance so i i just enjoy i enjoyed that that sort of combination of things mm -hmm. and and felt i wanted to do more in this space do you think it's also the variety um so for me what what i get excited about uh investing is just the the short attention span that i have so you know i've i've i, I struggled with changing jobs every two to three years. And, um, uh, and then uh, for me, it just meant um, that, that just that variety was important, but um, I, I'm curious if that's kind of something that also was a differentiating factor that got you excited. You know, the fact that you can work with different founders, different industries, different problems. Um, yeah. I was curious about that. Well, um, I suppose it's, it was the same with consulting to some extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'd work on a project that could be, probably the shortest would have been a week I'd have thought um and sure. and then other six seven eight months mm -hmm. I mean I got I got flown out to Puerto Rico and was yeah. dumped in Puerto Rico for nearly nine months um mm -hmm. flying back and forth every third weekend for a long weekend um yeah. you know that's a good point you, you kind of get chucked around on all these different projects and that that was interesting <clears> to <throat> me mm -hmm. what I call the sweaty palm moment as well you're you're kind of you're panicking internally you're thinking sure you know how I've got to read all the stuff I've got to get up to speed mm -hmm. in all these different areas. And you go through the sort of sweaty palm fear. Yeah. Um, then you touch down, then you start to sort of, you know, find your way a bit and then you start to become um, a bit competent and then you start to really get your handle on it. And then you're like, okay, look, I can do this. And then it's like boom. And then you're pushing and then you're growing and then you're starting to feel in your head. Um, so you start to get the stuff in your head where you're just like, why, why are they doing it this way? Like I've been in here now like one week, one month or whatever it is. And to me, it's like crystal clear that you should be doing this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And, and you start to then get comfortable, not comfortable, but you start yeah. to get sort of comfortable in it again. Sure. And then you do start to feel like a bit, a bit bored <laughs> in the sense you're kind yeah. of going like, come on guys, why, why, why are you doing it this way? Why is it like this? And, and you should have done it like this. And yeah. this needs to change. If that changes, we can move on. And so you do kind of go through that cycle mm -hmm. sometimes very quickly, sometimes longer, but yeah, that change, that changing element is, is, is bit, it's pretty addictive yeah. because you go through like a, a whole relationship of emotions mm -hmm. sometimes within weeks. Sure. With investing, it's a similar thing, you know, something sort of turns up and you, the really interesting stuff is when um, <clears throat> for me is when, when you look at it and you're like, Oh, I don't, what are these guys doing like this oh, it's completely over your head and then you yeah. start picking away at it and then you start realizing you're like okay well this is no this is interesting because if you do it this way everyone else has been doing it this way and you yeah. know 
this is this is an interesting take on it and then you stop but you've gone from that sort of complete lack of understanding mm -hmm. accelerating yourself through research to 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 be a you know what i call dangerously competent you're kind of you feel sure. you feel you feel like you know you're doing a bit and yeah. but you're probably a bit um you know maybe slightly overconfident in terms of what you know but um you do go through that cycle mm -hmm. um and that is it's 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 really interesting because every company you know every startup that's built is generally one or two people maybe three people that have come together depending on how early you interact with that business you're really in a pub talking to two or three people yeah so you've got a business that's built around them so mm -hmm. you're basically saying are people's personalities different and like yeah so <laughs> when when you're meeting all these different companies that they're, they're all really different and they're all I mean, some of them are the same, and you know, some sort of. I went to some event in, I think it was Web Summit, and there was a whole section of geotagged picture, you know, companies. There's probably like 50 sure. of them in a row. I'm like, oh, you know, they're all exactly the same. But when yeah. you when you look at sort of technology businesses, you do find that they're all, they're all different because they're all so personal to those people. Mm -hmm. So it's super interesting. It's super varied, and it's super challenging. You know, the really good businesses are that they're they're, they're they're doing something that's just quite you like just nicely clever you're just like that's mm -hmm. i like what you're doing like i like the way that's done and you get your own sure. little um taste of the aha moment because mm -hmm. you when you finally you when you sort of you, you click you're like okay yeah. like and it just from and you're like i get exactly what you're doing i get what you're building and this is cool this is interesting so yeah i enjoyed that element of it the sort of yeah. versatility and um, versatile nature of it all um, and i guess the big difference too you know the variety is similar to consulting, but you're not operating, right? You're kind of supporting the founder. So I think that's, um, that is a huge differentiating factor. Um, I, I don't know if you know Arun from Greenshores Capital. He's in the UK, but he was a guest uh, a couple of weeks ago and he had a funny expression. It's, uh, he was saying VCs being like a grandparent because uh, you're giving the money to your grandkids. You're not really ordering them around, but you're letting yeah. them kind of do the thing. So that that does sound valid to me in, in some instances. Yeah, uh, although my... My so we've got I've got three kids and yeah. <laughs> my mum says um, I love being a grandparent because you come mm -hmm. over and you play with the kids yeah. although all the COVID rules is you can only have one grandparent but anyway yeah. um, you come over and play with them but you but you can hand them back at the end of the day yeah but you don't have to deal with the headache so I'd I'd probably stretch the analogy to say that um, yes but unfortunately like a grandchild you can't just sort of give it back when it's yeah. unhappy and starts shouting and screaming we can, we can like... add that we can add that caveat <laughs> what, what i've noticed yeah. too is grandparents you know they advertise that hey you know have a bunch of kids i mean you got three kids so i don't know if that you know they they tricked you too but um you know sometimes you know my parents in the beginning i, I got a three-year-old but they're like hey you know have kids because we're gonna babysit all the time and what I've noticed is uh, grandparents, they just want to live their life now. You know, they're mm -hmm. not, they don't want to sit around and babysit. So you're pretty much uh, on your own as far as finding childcare. Um, but yeah. that's just, look, that's my situation. Um, I, I have a buddy of mine that has like three kids and his parents just put so much pressure on them. They're like, look, you know, have another kid. We're going to babysit. We're going to come over there. And uh, he had three kids and he had, he had to get a nanny. So uh, <laughs> nice. Not, not, um, they're, they're s s uh, probably s the correct amount of interaction. I yeah. don't, not, not yeah. too much, not too little. So. Yeah. But I appreciate the caveat. Yeah. I think that's right. I think, uh, essentially when you're supporting the founder, you're not really handing them off. They're still somewhat attached to you at least for like seven to 10 yeah. years. So, yeah. yeah. So at least, you know, if you did the analogy, you know, you're living with them until maybe grade school or something like that or middle school. Yeah. You, you can't sort of, you, there is a, an extrable relationship that you require. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a horrible stat, but I, I think mm -hmm. the relationship lasts longer than, unfortunately, the average marriage. Marriage, um, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's like <laughs> you, you, you choose that more carefully than you choose your own uh, husband or wife. Um, yeah. Um, great. Yeah. So and then so was this a super seed or was this another fund? Uh, no. So so that was um, that was twenty. 12 to 2014 um and then i'd had a second kid by now mm -hmm. i rung my wife up and said uh i'm coming home early um 
and she was like, "Oh, that's great," because I did that didn't that didn't happen that often. Um, mm -hmm. I think just quickly going back to what you need around you, um, you need some very um, very supportive and um, understanding people, persons. Mm -hmm. um my wife is um yeah pretty pretty formidable like she's an, an amazing woman but she's also then in her own right has to put up with all my crap that happens because of the life choices i've made sure. in terms of the career yeah. that i've taken so um you know mm. it, it, to, to, to have someone that can put up with all that and to keep you know positive and things that's a super important thing so anyway i rang her up and said look i'm i'm coming home she's like that's great mm -hmm. i said yeah well, I've, I've got some news oh, okay fine you know what are you doing i said um i i i, I quit i quit i quit my job and sure. she was like um okay well i'm sure you've done it for a valid reason i'll see you in two hours when you get home <laughs> and i'm like <laughs> okay so i get home and uh it, it I'd grown within the business and um, I designed an investment fund to exploit situations in um, Australia. So Australia yeah. had a very large pension uh, uh, market, but very small VC market. And sure. we were going to do a sort of reverse rocket internet, I suppose, to some extent, mm -hmm. find technologies that were, that were either being built there that could be commercialized in Europe, um, yeah. uh, use the capital there and use some, there was a benefit from a tax perspective as well. You could do research on both sides of the pond. Anyway, I'd built this fund and we'd agreed to go to partner and uh, long story short, we, we, we decided to part ways. So, um, I had a, you know, bit of money, not, not, not tons, but you know, enough that I didn't have to sort of jump into a job straight away, started searching. Um, then the decision, do I go back into corporate, mm -hmm. um, get, you know, nice fat salary that's yeah. paid every month and <clears throat> I might get a bonus and I get no more consulting business, get, right? I get pension. Yeah. But <laughs> then, you know, you, 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 you get paid well and it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's at the level I was at by that point. Um, and much to my wife's, um, initial horror, I said, I found this, I found this startup. Um, I think, I think they're onto something. I think it's, sure. I think it's interesting. Um, and it was a company called Syndicate Room. They were an online investment company growing mm -hmm. up in the sort of crowdfunding time. Sure. Um, and looking to basically co-invest alongside angels and VCs and do it online, do it digitally, mm -hmm. 1,000 pound minimum. Um, so it's sort of accessible. Yeah. Um, there was some fund options that I, we sort of initially thought about and mm -hmm. all sorts of different stuff. So I, I joined there um, and really enjoyed the journey like it was tough mm -hmm. um lots of ups and downs but it really started sort of refining my my understanding of the investment landscape yeah. built out a really big network we had thirty five thousand high net worth members sure um i was designing investment funds i was doing all this different stuff and and that sort of started to really crystallize my interest in in angel investing and, and what was and, your role to to build relationships with more lps so um no so I, I joined as investment director and then grew to, <clears throat> okay. to chief investment officer so sure. i was responsible for all deal flow uh, coming in all the different sort of models we built on and, and, and sort of partnerships and things like that so i built yeah. a partnerships team um i designed and developed the first passive fund for early stage investing oh that's great so, almost like an etf for, uh, for exactly. private companies yeah 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 so looking at how we can sort of bring diversification into mm -hmm. early stage investing um, I got that off the ground and I think we, between us and the rest of the team, we raised um, about $15 million into mm -hmm. that fund and, and started investing. By the time I'd left, it had invested in 80-odd 80, 80 companies um, within about two years. So mm -hmm. um, it was doing what we wanted to. Um, and then I also managed their growth fund, which was a direct investment, normal venture capital fund. Oh, sure. Um, really enjoyed it. It was It was super tough um lots to learn you know built the team up there um again highs and lows highs and lows you know awards um uh, all sorts of different things like that um i think we got up to around uh 28 mil valuation mm -hmm. um we raised institutional money into the business um we invested in over 230 companies um we won lots and lots of different awards for what we were doing yeah. Um, so really, really good sort of proving ground. <clears throat> mm -hmm. When I decided to leave there in May last year, um, we had a sort of decision to make, you know, 
where do I go next and what do I want to do? Do I want to kind of pursue this passive investing sure. line or do I want to go more the active? And that's when I joined Superseed. Mm-hmm. Um, and Superseed is a early stage business to business software and deep tech fund. Mm-hmm. Um, and we put a lot of focus on uh, sales. Sure. Um, so poor distribution is the number one killer of startups. Um, yet, in our opinion, VCs don't really, you know, don't really put enough effort into to understanding mm-hmm. is there real good product market fit. Um, and the other thing that was interesting from my perspective was that um, in the US, about 60% of VCs come from entrepreneurial background. Mm-hmm. Um, in the UK, it's only 8%. Interesting. So, so where do they come from in the UK? Investment banking, okay. law, all sorts of different, you know, economics, sort yeah. of different routes in consulting. Um, and what are the pros and cons of that? So, you know, is it, do you think well, it's tough? Do you think it's a negative that you're coming from banking and now going into VC? Um, I think it depends on how innovative you want to be as a VC. Yeah. Um, your deal flow is like deal flow is king. Like you have to have mm-hmm. access to the best deal flow. You, you can be yeah. very competent and just not be known. Sure. You, you could be the greatest uh, person in terms of an, a, analysis, but if no one knows you. No one's yeah. speaking to you. No one's giving you the, the deals. You're, you're pretty much worthless equally, you know, you, you, so you're far better to be well connected and incompetent than mm-hmm. um, highly competent and completely unconnected. Sure. Um, so, you, you having a network of people if you're in banking law etc you 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 get those networks so that puts yeah. you up a lot you come from an analytic, analytical background you're very mm-hmm. competent with numbers etc so they're all good things i just think that yeah. it's it's useful to know firsthand what they're going through mm-hmm. and what they're going to go through sure so that maybe you can have a bit more compassion um yeah. A bit more foresight, a bit more coming, speaking from a, a position of, of genuinely knowing, um, not just, you know, a textbook says that you're going to do this or something. And I'm not saying that yeah. other VCs do that, but, um, yeah, it's just, in my opinion, it was very interesting to find people that had done it and done it successfully. So they've sure. got eight exits within the group of, of, of partners, mm-hmm. um, four by investment, four by entrepreneurship yeah um so end-to-end experience very very focused on you know the biggest killer of startups um so very sort of focused investment thesis and just hyper competent people um sure. always always surround yourself with people that are better than you if you can yeah absolutely um, and that's what i've tried to do um just hopefully they won't find out that i'm not as good <laughs> I'm sure you're great. Um, you know, we're, we're always tougher on ourselves than we, uh, than we should be. So, yeah. Um, that's great. So, and then, so with super seed too, what are some of the things that you guys look for in founders? Like what, what are some things that excite you when you first see a founder, uh, in your sector? And then, uh, what are some red flags? So, um, we, we like people that are doing something with some sort of technical mate, Mm-hmm. or some some moat uh, to some yeah. extent whether it's technical based you know ip or competency or something but we like them to have this moat normally that means that normally not always but normally that means they're doing something technically quite clever maybe not complex but clever yeah when you get highly technical people as i've experienced in in engineering they're not always the best sales people um, sure. i think is the probably the politest way i can say it yeah um it's always a pleasure when they don't look at their feet and stuff. Um, so if you're, if you've got this highly sort of hopefully highly defensible technology, um, maybe a bit of a gap in, in their ability to sell. Um, that's interesting for us because what we then do is we spend quite a lot of time with the founders, um, and the sales teams, if they've got them in place by the time we're speaking to them, um, calling existing clients, interviewing existing clients, um, shadowing sales calls, um, finding new sales leads for them to to, um, to to convert, and for us, then privately we'll do our own sales calls. So yeah. what we're doing is we're kind of unpicking: is there good product market fit? Yeah. 
um, is this genuinely a problem that needs to be solved? And then that sort of, you know, that trifecta of things sort of comes together when you've got a, you know, a, a very, very focused, very competent mm-hmm. set of founders or founder solving something that's genuinely needed by the market mm-hmm. and that market need is big. Um, yeah. If we can, and we don't always do it, but, you know, if we're <clears> even, because <throat> so, we do sales calls, if we're able yeah. to sell or highly involved in selling their software, Sure. And, you know, we can see that firsthand that this is wanted by the market. Mm-hmm. You've then got something where it's a case of scaling that into, into the demand rather than spending all your time and effort trying to either develop the product to fit a demand that might be there or marketing something where there is not the demand. So you're trying to mm-hmm. convince people that this thing's interesting. And so by unpicking that early, that stops us then and other investors later down the line spending yeah. a load of money trying to develop a new thing or market the hell out of it. Sure. Um, That's an interesting model too, because it's, you know, you're, you know, a lot of funds advertise that they're founder friendly, they roll up their sleeves. Um, you know, you see that on most of the websites, but some of them just allocate capital, but it's great that you also help them with sales. Bonnie, I don't know if you remember when we went to that ski trip, I think it was like Newark Venture Partners. Um, yes. They also have a sales arm, like, and I thought that was really interesting. So I see that emerging a lot, you know, just really having to get much more hands on and really help them with uh, customers, especially with deep tech. You know, you're dealing with scientific technology. You know, some of the founders are PhDs, so they're mm-hmm. not necessarily uh, that's someone that's cold calling. <laughs> so, um, but I think it's a great model. I, you know, I remember, yeah, I think Newark venture partners, they have, they hired like a salesperson to come in and like really help the startup, um, accelerate and, and possibly even build a sales team. So I think that's important well, that, to offer. And that's part of what we do post investment yeah. as well. We, we mm-hmm. try and sort of help on the sales strategy. Yeah. We've actually, um, so we, we're involved in recruitment. Um, we've just actually placed a CEO within, within one of the companies as well so they oh, sure. talking about the sort of mm-hmm. shining a light on yourself and and you know w- within that business the the they wanted yeah. a ceo that could do mm-hmm. the things that they can't and and that's to have it that early on is, is yeah that's super you know that's really nice starting point yeah. because it shows you that they're honest and open and aware of the benefits and and sort of, yeah, you know, I've seen that gaps. similar characteristic too. I mean, I've had a scientific CEO that ended up just hiring another CEO because the vision for the scientific person, he really just wanted to run a lab. Um, he yeah. wasn't really thinking about the commercial strategy, but he was happy because he was important because um, he had all these subject matter expertise, but he necessarily didn't even have the interest to yep. run the company and build culture. So I think, you know, like inserting the right person. Um, and you often see that in private equity, but, you know, seeing, you know, that happen in venture is, um, is great to see. Um, and then I think with deep tech, you know, cause we, we look at deep tech as well. Uh, what's an exciting, you know, sci-fi tech that you're looking at. We've looked at space. We've looked at, you know, lab grown, uh, foods. Um, but you know, I, I had a guy from the UK, I think it was mid then he was talking about fission technology. Um, so that was like completely new to me, but any kind of new areas of deep tech that, that are getting you super excited. Yeah. I mean, um, so one of our most recent investments is into a business called AI build Mm -hmm. and they have, so, so 3d additive manufacturing is this sort of, you know, kind of like the holy grail of manufacturing if 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 it can be scaled because yeah. um if it's perfect each time um it's zero waste um you can design and build things that you just can't do any other way than, sure. than 3d printing um you can be multi-material throughout the whole product you know mm-hmm. so you can change its um uh, structural um, capabilities the thermal capabilities all sorts of different stuff so it's kind of like this holy grail but in reality when you're making things, especially at scale, if you're building stuff at a large scale, the mm-hmm. errors really start to, to magnify sure. and fluctuations in temperature, mm-hmm. flow rate, all these different things through the nozzle, the different nozzle heads, the materials, all this stuff then boils down to, to um, user capability. So mm-hmm. the, 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 the technician building the product for the, you know, maybe it's one or two or three prototypes or something, you know, they have to do multiple, multiple, multiple runs of, of the, 
um, system before they can actually get something that's close to what they want. Yeah, sure. And AI build is is developed um, software that that takes all those parameters and gets you zeroed in. Uh, the aim is to become first time, but you know I don't think they're hundred percent there yet. But you know the aim is that it can get you really zeroed in super early because it, it uses AI to 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 analyze all of those different um, mm -hmm. data sets, all the materials you're using, the flow rate, the temperatures, etc., to uh, uh, adjust and compensate for all the errors that are going to be stacked up, so that you can get something very very close very very quickly. And I think they are opening up, you know orders of magnitude in terms of what can get built first time correctly. Sure. Um, and then you're able to do, you know, prototypes for all sorts of different businesses and then um, moving from prototype to full end, mm -hmm. you know, manufacturing quality, you know, actual scale um, uh, uh, um, systems and, and um, products. And yeah, they've got some amazing projects they're working on. Um, oh, wow. As with all these things, it's, um, difficult to talk about all of them but um sure. one of them is an f1 client um and yeah the stuff they're doing is just it's awesome and because it's a software driven thing mm -hmm. they are um kind of technology agnostic in that sense so as the industry improves that the robots get better the nozzles get better all these different stuff yeah. they're able to adapt so they are the brain of what 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 3d additive manufacturing could be so for me that's super exciting that is exciting wow that's great um, well, hey, this was amazing. I, I know we're at time. Um, if we do have questions, do you have like maybe a minute or two to take yeah, a couple of additional ones? Yeah, okay. yeah, of course, of course. All right, cool. So I'll open it up. If anybody has any questions, um, looks like someone just joined the meeting now. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I guess uh, anybody in the audience have any questions? Bonnie, feel free to chime in with uh, your two cents or questions. Oh, I was just wondering, and I, I posted in the chat if, if you have a specific geolocation on which you're focused. So, say that again, sorry? Oh, if you're focused on, are you geolocation specific or you look at companies globally? Um, so at the moment we, so in the UK, they have quite a uh, um, beneficial tax structure for early stage mm -hmm. investing. Um, it's the enterprise investment scheme. And um, that means that you, 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 the businesses need to be UK based or have a sort of UK presence. So our fund at the moment is EIS. Um, we're in the process now of raising our more traditional LPGP fund, which will be um, then pan-European. Um, the um, exposure to the US is, um, is very difficult from a regulatory <laughs> perspective. Sure. Um, so we're, we're, we're governed by the FCA, which is, which is, um, you know, fine. Um, but, but we, we, we generally don't want to get particularly involved in SEC because it becomes a bit of a headache. So, um, we don't invest in the U U S businesses. There are some businesses that have come across from the U S um, normally I don't wish to be always the same, but normally that's not a great sign. <laughs> Um, if you're not, if you're not able to do it in the U S and you, and you're coming yeah. to the UK, um, unless it's sort of, you know, well, I, know you, I suppose you can't even use a weather-based um, focus. <laughs> if, it's, if it's rain and sort of grey clouds that you need for your business, then maybe that's an argument to come to the UK. But um, if it's a technology business and you were in San Fran and you failed to raise any money there and came over here, it's not a great sign. So, um, yeah, so UK at the moment, um, pan-European, hopefully in, in 12 months' time. Thank you. That's great. Well, if there's no other questions, what I always ask every guest at the end is uh, if they have any life advice. So anything that you learned from a mentor, I think we had a lot of nuggets in this talk, um, but anything else that you got for us as far as just uh, looking back or uh, thinking, thinking about something that maybe a mentor gave you as advice, uh, we'll take that back with us. I think, I think valuing your time is, is very important. And mm -hmm. to do that very early, is, is it worth your time? It's very tempting to to think that that thing, that task is going to cost me 500 pounds to do. I haven't got 500 good cash or I don't want to spend 500 pounds cash. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just do it. I'll sort it out. Um, but then you start realizing that you're not going to do it as, as well as someone else. Um, mm -hmm. you, you might be able to do it as well as them, but actually your time would be better spent doing something else. And you bring a lot more value long term coming in if you sure. if you just bin that task and give it to someone else. The other thing is, is just don't, it, 
well, my personal belief, my, my choice is that make a decision on what is successful for you. I have um, a very nice house. It's not a mansion, you know, it's a nice, ginormous house, but very nice house. I've got a car that's fine. Um, I've got a wonderful place that I live. And most importantly, I've got a, a, a lovely wife and, and my mm -hmm. kids and I live with my friends and I enjoy my life. And so I would argue for me, like and no one else can argue any other way. Yeah. I'm very, 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 very successful. I'm, I've, I, I'm sure. super happy in that sense. If you're obsessed by money and, you know, that's what's going to make you feel successful, mm -hmm. then really question does it because i've met lots of people that are yeah. worth lots of zeros past what i'm worth and they're not happy at all mm -hmm. um so make make sure you're doing something you really enjoy because that will make you feel successful and make sure you value your time and make sure you value the people around you yeah i couldn't agree more i've been in that situation yeah. where i got paid what i thought i should be getting paid at like the age i was and uh I was miserable <laughs> and I ended up leaving uh, after like two years. So, so totally agree with that. Um, so, Hey, this was amazing. Uh, we covered a lot more than I thought we would. And it was great, you know, getting to know you a little more and uh, really appreciate all your time and, you know, have Pleasure. a great week. Yeah. Thank you yeah, James. Thanks everyone for, for listening and yeah. Thanks yeah, very much good. for organizing. Yeah. Cheers, absolutely. Bunny.